a few weeks ago, at around 9 p.m., I think it was on a Thursday, I received a literal wake-up call. It was the local police department telling me that some people had reported that my camper had been broken into. The city was in chaos due to heavy snowfalls and since my car had broken down the day before, I had to walk a good distance through the snow to confirm what passers-by had reported to the cops already. With the door pried open and a window smashed in, I arrived at the scene to tell the cops, yes, thanks for calling me, the camper has indeed been broken into, will you come now? It took them three hours to arrive and I had to wait for them, because I couldn't tamper with the crime scene before they had checked it out. But I also couldn't just leave the camper like this, by the side of the road, smashed window, open door and all. But actually, from stolen license plates over graffiti to hit and runs, this was the sixth time in three years that I had to deal with crimes related to my camper alone. It's now on my own property again, but that property is far from secure. An important step in increasing security around the shop was to install various IP cameras. But for those of you who haven't dealt with them before, let me summarize what you can do with them. This is a pen and tilt IP camera by the Tapo slash TP-Link brand. This is not a sponsored video, by the way. I chose this model for this video because at around 30 bucks, it's really affordable and rather common. I didn't want to base my build on something obscure that nobody has at home or wouldn't be able to afford. After installing the free app and connecting your camera to the local Wi-Fi, you can access the camera with your phone. Usually you wouldn't do that as you stand right in front of it, of course, but rather from wherever you happen to be. Say you're on vacation and the camera's motion detection software would alert you that a movement or more specifically a person has been spotted in or in front of your home. You can then access the camera feed and have a closer look. If there would be someone who doesn't belong there, you can set off an alarm via the camera's built-in loudspeaker or use two-way audio to scare them away or have a chat with them if you want to. In other cases, people might decide to just call the cops, etc. It depends on the situation, of course. Since these cameras are rather affordable now, I bought and installed a number of them around the shop. However, I realized very quickly that even with HD resolution or better, there are still many spots in any given room that you just can't really inspect very well with your cameras that are installed in fixed places. The idea of a remotely controlled camera robot that could simply drive around the place came up very quickly. And there are commercial solutions for this, but they tend to be either quite expensive or very limited in the camera angles that are even possible. I even bought this broken specimen here, a RoboMaster S1 by DJI. It has a camera and a gimbal and everything, but it's actually an educational tool. It's supposed to be used within the same Wi-Fi network, so I guess it doesn't really come with the capability of remotely controlling it from an external network or via mobile internet while you're on vacation, for example. Well, I'm currently trying to repair it, but I can tell you already that it is not very repair friendly. It might still be covered in a follow-up to this video where I want to go deeper into the whole home security thing. Right now it's all about a different idea though. I had wondered for years about the following question. If I can buy a remote control high resolution video camera for little money that already comes with built-in motors and a free software solution that is ready to go, can I just use that device to build a remote control camera robot only that the functions and motors for tilting and panning will be used for driving and steering instead? Well, this video is the conclusion of several weeks of work in which I did just that. So follow me along and see what I came up with here. So let's begin then by tearing down one of these cameras and see what we got here. The hood can simply be popped off and it already reveals the camera's circuit board and a little stepper motor that is used for the tilting motion. The base can also simply be pulled off and now we can also see the second motor which is used for panning. This specific type of stepper motor is a 5 lead unipolar stepper motor with built-in gears. Both motors can be turned using the app. But this is a primitive open loop system without any kind of feedback. Upon startup, the camera runs through a routine that will simply push the motors in both directions with a set number of pulses. And the controls do not react to the fact that the camera's body might have reached the end stops already. During remote control mode, 
the possible number of steps for both panning and tilting in both directions are limited. Now in the case of the panning motion, that still means that we can go almost 180 degrees in both directions, which means that we can use the original motor and remote control panning feature to build a steering mechanism. The tilting motor, however, is limited to just a few pulses for both up and down, and it maybe allows for an overall motion range of 45 degrees. This means that we will have to find a workaround for the driving feature. The limited number of pulses would mean that we could only drive a very short distance before we are forced to reverse. If we use the original motor for driving, that is, the robot would also be annoyingly slow. The IP camera also didn't come with any wheels, of course, so we'll have to find a solution for all of this. But I already have an idea. I bought this RC toy car from a guy in the neighborhood for 10 bucks. It has the right side of wheels that I had in mind, and given that the robot will be heavy enough, the rubber tires will also allow for sufficient traction to drive over dirt and smaller obstacles that can't be avoided in a workshop environment. After detaching the chassis and taking apart the frame of the small vehicle, I have now salvaged this rear axle assembly here. It comes with a small brushed DC motor with reduction gear and a differential. It also has a suspension with two steel springs. Inside the gearbox we can see the differential and reduction and also some parts of an EMI filter consisting of ceramic capacitors and some small inductors. Now they might look like resistors at first glance but these are color-coded miniature inductors that only look like resistors. We can basically reuse all of this. We'll not reuse the original steering mechanism of the car though, but rather build a new one. But the old wheels will be part of that new mechanism and that's why I salvage those as well. It was clear to me from the beginning that we would need a steering mechanism that will allow us to see where we are going in first person view and that's why I drew this sketch of a rather unusual approach that I had used before many years ago for another project. I translated my sketch into a design in Fusion 360 and used a 3D printer to print out the parts and here is how it will work. The motor is first inserted into this block shaped part here. Then glue needs to be applied before we can fasten this thin layer of plastic here that will hold the motor in place. Then this fork is slid over the motor shaft and then a little plastic axle is inserted into this hole in the bottom here around which the fork will rotate. Now a 6mm diameter axle is used to attach the wheel to the fork. This would also be glued. Last but not least a small plastic wedge is glued into the slot to fasten the fork around the motor shaft. I eventually used a smaller piece than this one, that's why I'm not actually gluing this into place. And the app's built-in panning feature can now be used for steering. The camera will be attached here as well in just a minute. But before I had decided how to actually mount the camera to the robot, I wanted to define its outer dimensions and figure out how to realize not just driving, but also wireless charging. The robot will not be of much use if it can't be driven to a charging station. In the next step, a midsection was designed that would have to fulfill three requirements. One, connect the front steering assembly to the rear drive assembly. Two, house the battery and wireless charging receiver. And three, house additional electronics. Now, it is rather bulky and not very beautifully designed. But its crude form is a result of the form factor of the battery and charging mechanism. Also when you start a project like this you will not know how much space you will actually need in the end for additional electronics and features and that's why it's better to just oversize it. The parts are glued together with super glue and the drive assembly is attached to the midsection via two additional parts that also allow me to reuse the original springs for the suspension. And here is the reason for the shape of the robot. A standard USB battery bank must fit into the tray at the bottom. And that bottom also has to be at a very short distance to the floor where the robot will eventually drive over this wireless charging pad that is normally used for charging phones. In order to be able to charge the battery bank this way, a wireless charging coil with a USB-C connector is glued to the vehicle's bottom as well. The receiver coil's USB cable is very short though and that is why the battery and the charging coil need to be very close to each other. 
This also provides the vehicle with a low center of gravity. In the next step, I designed this hollow, hemispherical part here that fits right over the IP camera's inner enclosure that also happens to be black. It is in turn glued to the top of the fork, where I had left those holes on purpose. Even a normal size 3D printer could have made many of these parts in one print, by the way. But in developing something like this, there's a lot of trial and error involved. And often the printer will need an entire day to make the parts. That's why I like to print out smaller sections and glue them together later. And I do that only if they actually fit together and do what I have in mind. For example, I first wasn't sure if I really wanted to place the camera in the front or here in the middle of the robot. Before I then eventually decided to add a second IP camera in the rear. In the next step, many of the wires connected to the original circuit board needed to be extended. I did that by simply soldering extensions to the existing wires and insulating them with heat shrink where it was necessary. And in the end, the camera enclosure was then glued onto the steering fork. With all that in place, I still needed to find a way to actually control the brushed DC motor with the signals intended for doing something completely different, i.e. moving a unipolar stepper motor a few steps back and forth. For this purpose, I came up with a simple circuit that solves the problem. Instead of switching the four stator windings of the little stepper, four 22 ohm resistors are connected as dummy loads in their place. From one of these dummy loads, another resistor leads to a dual comparator. The first comparator compares the voltage across the load resistor to a fixed voltage and also inverts the signal from active low to active high. That active high output signal then charges a small capacitor via a fast switching diode and a resistor. The voltage across that capacitor is then again compared by the second comparator to another fixed voltage. Whenever the capacitor voltage is higher than the fixed voltage, the DC motor is turned on via a MOSFET. This way, the robot will drive forward as long as a package of pulses come in. It doesn't care if you press up or down, it will always go forward. This way I can drive an unlimited distance with a limited number of pulses by simply switching the up and down buttons on the screen. The only downside, the robot can't drive backwards. But that wouldn't work so well anyway if you can't see where you're going. And the battery bank also needs to be modified to some degree. It consists of two parallel 3.7 volt lithium ion cells and it also has a little boost converter that will step up and stabilize the battery's fluctuating voltage, which is dependent on its charging state. But I found out during my tests that the built-in converter is not able to supply the cameras with a stable enough voltage when you turn the DC motor on and off under load as well. Both the cameras and motor also require a higher voltage between 7 and 9 volts, rather than the standard 5 volts the converter will normally put out. And that is why the red wire connects directly to the plus pole of the cell, circumventing the boost converter altogether. The gray wire, on the other hand, is the output of that converter in case I want to use it after all for something else. That way I don't have to fit bulky USB connectors into the vehicle's enclosure. While the most important features were taken care of at this point, there still were a few other issues to solve. I designed and printed these two parts here that form a ramp in which the Qi charging pad is integrated. And here you can see that it does work. The blinking blue LED indicates that the battery bank is now indeed charging. The hard part is to navigate the robot precisely enough to actually come to a standstill at the right spot and it requires some trial and error. I'm already working on an additional mechanism that will stop the robot automatically, but it isn't ready yet. In the next step, I designed an adapter piece that will allow me to fasten this camera mount in the rear of the vehicle, where a second IP camera will be attached. I then also added some aluminium sidewalls and painted them black because I was getting impatient and didn't want to wait for the 3D printer again. A voltmeter was also integrated. Its purpose was to figure out which supply voltage would actually be the right one for the rear drive to work just at the right speed, while also running the cameras from the same supply. I also added some LEDs to the fork. Their purpose is the following. 
I wanted to be able to locate the robot's whereabouts and orientation with my fixed IP cameras that I installed in the shop. That's why I tried to come up with some position lights that would allow me to do that. The electronics and wires were then also tidied up and a self-made boost converter circuit was added to step up the battery voltage to around 8 volts. If you want to know how to build one yourself, check out my video about boost converters that you can find in the description, in which I actually built this very circuit. And even though I had already built a crude cover for the robot's midsection, I took the time to, well, design and print a better looking one after all. Last but not least, I added one final feature, two line lasers, that will help me to navigate the robot. One laser points in the direction of the camera, while the other one indicates the orientation of the vehicle's body. I hope that this would help in navigating confined spaces and avoid oversteering. And it was now time for the moment of truth. But since I'm doing all this to increase security around the workshop, I figured that it might not be the best idea to broadcast its exact layout for all the world to see. So follow me along to another room then, where we'll test the robot. Okay, so we'll do this as follows. We'll try to drive around the table, then return to the starting position and switch to the rear camera to inspect the room. We start by filming the robot from the outside and then I will show you the first person view footage. Keep in mind that while you do this, especially from mobile internet while far away, there's a delay between your commands, their execution and the video feed. That's why you have to make a move, then wait a moment and continue like with a Mars rover, only that the delay is much shorter, of course. And this is where we switch to the rear camera and have a look at the shelves just as an example. And here we are going through the exact same thing, only using the IP cameras instead. The limited data rate means that the picture will have lower quality while moving, as the change from frame to frame is much larger. Once you stand still though, the picture quality increases. But this is absolutely sufficient to navigate the room. And again we switch to the second camera and have a look around. Well so this is what I had in store for you today. If you have any ideas how you would go about this differently let me know. Or maybe you have another cool idea for a robot project or some other home security idea. In case you've been thinking that it might be better to just build the whole thing from scratch using a Raspberry Pi or something similar, well I'm already doing that right now. In fact I'm actually working on a second video about this whole home security idea. In case you liked this one, please give it a like, it really helps the channel. And in case you want to support future video production, consider making a donation. A link for that is in the video description. Or become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon. The neighborhood is seemingly getting worse each year. And I have witnessed everything from littering and drug dealing over vehicle theft, arson, vandalism and trespassing on private properties almost on a daily basis. Had to call the cops many times, but that never actually helped. In a functioning society, public spaces would be ruled by social control mechanisms, but those are increasingly lacking, especially in the big cities in the West. And I try to do my part to reclaim this neighborhood. You will often see me wasting my time cleaning up the streets. I've even confronted some people on a number of occasions who just had started casually hanging out on people's private porches and driveways littering and doing whatever, seemingly oblivious to the fact that you don't just walk on other people's properties. You know, but that's how it is. And maybe it's time to start, well, at the last line of defense here, my own private property.